Hello and welcome to this really exciting Meet the Author today. I'm joined by two of my favourite um, business leaders in the world. I admire these guys the most out of all business leaders. They are my absolute heroes. Um, we're on today with Paul Pullman and my dad, Richard Branson. She's not biased. <laughs> <laughs> not, not biased at all, but once we get speaking, I think you'll understand why I love these two so much. Um, both Paul and Dad have been changing business for good for decades and their commitment to using business to solve the world problems um, instead of creating them is just beyond inspiring. Um, the list of Paul's accolades is, is as long as, as my arm, if not as long as this house. Uh, so I won't say them all, but I just wanted to say um, just Paul inspires me in my role at Virgin as Chief Purpose and Vision Officer. He was the former CEO, CEO of Unilever, which was a public company, and he managed to embed purpose across every single element of that business all over the world. And he's a tireless leader and campaigner at the B team with my dad. And he's just written a book called Net Positive, which I have here. Um, and um, it's a brilliant book he's written with Andrew Winston. And it's the reason that we're here today. Um, I read this book last year and I just wanted to um, share it with everyone and share it with every business leader all over the world because it makes that really compelling case of why businesses need to take, uh, give more than they take. And furthermore, both Dad and Paul have proved that within their businesses, if you do that, it can also be good for business too. So thank you both very much for joining me today. Thank you for having us. Look forward I'm really to looking forward to quizzing you both. Dad was meant to be a co-host with me and and ask Paul the questions, but um, but I decided I just couldn't miss up miss this opportunity to actually ask Dad questions as well. So Dad, I'll be firing them your way too. Um, first of all, let's set the scene. I'd absolutely love to know how you guys met, um, how you know each other, and um, what you've learned from each other. Uh, so uh, Paul, I, um, if you go first, that would be great. Oh man, there's a lot in there, but. Um, I probably knew Richard well before he knew me when I was uh, actually we have a lot in common. Richard is born July 11th, uh, 18th, if, if I recall. I'm born July 11th, so we're not that far apart. Uh, he's a little bit younger than I am, as you can see. Life has been good for Richard, but uh, uh, I probably met him already when he started his record shop. My first record I bought when I was 14 years old was Greedens uh, Clearwater Revival Cosmos Factory. And I'm sure I bought it from his shop or from his mail order. So that was probably the first uh, interaction I had with Richard. But uh, seriously, I think mainly with the elders, I would say that um, our first meetings were probably around some of the common agendas for humanity at the, at the UN. Uh, Kofi Annan has been a long time friend. Uh, I've always been involved with the uh, Millennial Development Goals and later on the Sustainable Development Goals. But I guess we really started working together when we had our wonderful meeting in Ulusaba and started kicking off the uh, B team, which uh, was a very uh, appealing initiative that Richard started. And I remember him calling me. And when Richard calls you, you probably know yourself, Holly, you can't say no. So uh, that's when we started to work intensively together. And frankly, I've enjoyed every day since, despite um, Richard's incredibly uh, busy schedule. He always gives you the feeling that you're the most important person in the world. I mean, he always has time or gives you advice. And I like his uh, positive outlook, his what I call a purposeful play, perhaps, is a way to look at it. And um, and really, ultimately, embody, embodying what I think is uh, is great leadership, a great human being. And, and in all the things he does, uh, putting the interest of others ahead of himself. And there are too many to mention. But uh, obviously, some of the things that we're working on with the uh, B team is always uh, with Richard. It's always people are central. You know, some people talk abstract things and uh, scientific things that are hard to follow. But uh, Richard always brings it back to people in, in all its senses, be it fighting for a just transition or the death penalty or for the Ungers or for uh, the, the disasters unfolding now in, in this part of the world. And that's what it is ultimately. It's bringing humanity back to business. And I think he's always done that. And I've tried to learn from that as I started to run Unilever as well. Um, yeah, I'm just thinking Paul was just saying that uh, he, he celebrated his mother's uh, life uh, this weekend. Um, and uh, and I just 
so glad that she was old enough to have seen uh, everything that, that Paul has achieved. Um, uh, you know, for years, um, you know, Paul was seen as uh, the one businessman in the world uh, that um, that we could all look up to um, um, to take on a, a massive company like Unilever and try to uh, turn it around to become a positive force for good uh, is not easy. And and it and he managed to set an example to all the other massive companies in the world. Um, and um, you know, so you know, if you're going to get 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 a gr group of business leaders together, um, obviously, once you're going to seek out Paul to chair that group of leaders, because you know he he was um, at the time when he was still running Unilever as well. Um, uh, the, you know that that you know the the epitome of what what we should all be aspiring to. Um, so uh, so it's been tremendous working working together uh, with you, Paul, and. Um, a great honour to to um, have this discussion with you and with with Holly and with all the team at Virgin. Well, and now I'm sure you can all see why I'm so excited about this interview. Not only are these two men wonderful leaders, but they're also just unbelievably kind at heart. And um, you can see so generous to each other because you've both done just amazing things in the world. So thank you. And and now, Paul, you brought this wonderful book into the world. Um, net positive. I, I really, I really enjoyed. I loved reading it. I really did, and I, and, and you sort of made me really realise just how important it is to just continue to be driving, changing the figures, changing business for good at Virgin um, within my role as Chief Purpose and Vision Officer. And I, I absolutely love it. And it's just so great to have inspirational leaders like you to look up to. You've been doing this for so long. You've been changing business for good. You've been, you've been putting purpose at the heart of the business for decades. Why did you decide to write the book now? Um, and why do you think that message is so important at the moment, more than ever? Before I uh, answer that, Holly, I want to digress a little bit because I was mentioning how does Richard stay young so, so, uh, and, and so, uh, so energetic. And I remember Simon Perez telling me once when I was always fascinated with people getting older, but appealing to all generations. And your dad is one of them. He's like sort of the Mick Jagger of the business world. And Simon Perez was one of them. Desmond Tutu was one of them. So as you get older, perhaps there was a little bit of a fear of myself of getting older. How do you stay relevant? And he said something very um, astute. He said, uh, because I was asking him, you know, Startup Nation Israel, and he was talking about dot com and everything. And he said, uh, it's very simple, Paul, when the list of things you have to do is longer than the list of things you have done, you stay young. And I think that is also uh, how I would characterize your dad. So anyway, writing a book, I, I never really wanted to write a book because many of the CEOs of these publicly traded companies who write books is either to rewrite history or to, for many to stroke their egos, and that wasn't really appealing to me. But Adi Ignatius uh, told me, he said, you know, there are so many people that want to benefit from your learnings, your mistakes, and your journey to be able to do the same thing or, or hopefully accelerate it. And so this is probably one of the better ways to reach them. As I started working the book with uh, Andrew Winston, who has written two books that uh, I enjoyed. One is called The Big Pivot, and the other one is goes from, from green to gold. And uh, so he's a very good writer. I wanted some perspective from someone living in the US as well in the book. So we wrote it together. And the more we started writing it, I actually sort of uh, changed my initial idea and said, well, you know, instead of writing the book, we should actually create a movement, a movement of what good looks like. If I put it in one sentence, it's very simple. This world is 4.6 billion years old. and if you put it on a scale of 46 years, uh, human beings have only been here for four hours. The Industrial Revolution started one minute ago, and in that one minute, we've destroyed 50% of the world's forests. In the last five decades, we've lost 68% of the world's species, mammals, birds, reptiles. Um, we're living well beyond our planetary boundaries. And, uh, uh, you know, I think, again, with COVID is a great example another zoonotic disease of destruction of biodiversity. COVID itself should not have been a surprise. We've had Zika, SARS, Ebola, Asian flu. What is perhaps the surprise more than ever is our inability to work together to ensure that everybody in the world is protected. 
but the destruction of biodiversity is continuing and the next uh, zoonotic disease is already waiting around the corner. So we need to change the things that we're doing. If um, we can't have infinite growth on a finite planet and anything you can do forever is by definition unsustainable. And yet so many companies are still in the mode of of uh, marginal improvements, what I call playing uh, not to lose versus playing to win. I think yeah, that is a great example of how you have to have an expensive mindset and and set the bar high, reach for the stars, uh, which he literally does uh, to not end up with mud in your hands. But very few people do that, unfortunately. So in the absence of governments uh, really being able to move forward at the speed that is needed, in the absence of multilateralism really working, and I think we're at a low point right now, it is the role and it is the obligation of business to fill that void and step up. Business cannot succeed in these societies that fail, nor do I think that they can be bystanders in a system that gives them life in the first place. So this book is about encouraging business to step up. This book is about encouraging business to move from corporate social responsibility or CSR to what I call RSC, responsible social corporations. Move out of the less bad. You know, I used to murder 10 people. Now I only murder five people. Am I a better murderer? It just doesn't work anymore. And yet, if you go to Glasgow or if you go to the UN meetings or all the others, the WEFs, some of them we participate in, you hear people making commitments of a little bit less carbon emission, a little bit less plastics in the ocean, a little bit less deforestation. So in a nutshell, when you've overshot the planetary boundaries, we need to start thinking restorative, reparative, regenerative, and that is what we call net positive. And that takes courage. We ask a simple question. How can companies profit now from solving the world's problems, not from creating the world's problems? With a follow-up question, is, is the world better off, yes or no, because your company is in it? And I'm not sure that many of the CEOs still today can answer that affirmatively. It's one of the reasons why we created the B team. To, to some extent, this book is a homage to the B team. It's bringing humanity back to business and trying to help uh, the readers in very simple steps in, a, in starting with a personal transformation, working your company transformation, and then in the broader systems transformations to lead the journey. In, uh, as a final sentence, for us, a net positive company is a company that takes responsibility of its total handprint in society, all consequences intended or not. Many companies outsource their value chain and they also think they can outsource their responsibility. That doesn't work anymore. Net positive companies work for the long term. They try to optimize the return for all of their stakeholders. In fact, they see shareholder return as a result of what they, of what they do, not a myoptic objective. And then last but not least, they uh, participate in the broader transformation of society, just like the Fortune companies do or Fortune Unite. You're part of a bigger movement, optimizing within a current system that is, desi that is not designed anymore to deliver, only brings you so far. These net positive companies are through system changes and move those boundaries. How wonderful if we can get every single company in the world doing this and, and books like yours will help that. And what's been really heartening is I work a lot with startup businesses and most startup businesses nowadays are absolutely doing this from the very beginning. It's a bit harder to turn around big business. Um, fortunately, people are doing it now, but um, th th it's been really heartening to see that small businesses are doing this from the day one. And Paul, I don't know if you, you remember, but you may remember 15 years ago, you came and spoke to our senior leadership team at Virgin and um, and and you came to speak about this this topic all the way back then about how businesses should be um, uh, uh, you know giving more than they take how we should be putting purpose at the heart of everything that we do um, and and we definitely had some skeptics in the room then you know some of our senior leaders were not on board but I could just see as you kept on speaking the penny dropped um, and and it was a really wonderful moment. It was a wonderful moment for me. It was when I decided that the purpose was the area of business I wanted to go into. It was a really wonderful moment for the people in our in our company who were working on purpose because we were doing it. We had Jean Wang and we had Charlotte Goodman who are were our our in our purpose gurus at Virgin. We were on that journey, 
but there were just some people that they were having to push up against. And as soon as you came and spoke and we could see that this was something that was so important um, and, and actually that it was also going to be ben a benefit to our business as well. Um, and, and that's when it really turned around and we started embedding it at everything we were doing. Dad was doing it from the beginning. He very much was focusing on people and customers and how we could be making sure we did the right thing for our people and customers. Um, and then when you came and spoke to us, we realised that there was just a little bit other things that we should be doing as well. And, and we made sure we were. And it's been great. It's been an amazing journey to be on. Um, are you finding that nowadays when you speak to people, business leaders are more receptive to this now than they ever were before? Yeah, first of all, uh, Holly, I still remember that meeting, which was great fun, by the way. And, and I'm so pleased to see that you're now actually being the chief purpose and inspiration officer because uh, you know, we all have come a long way. In fact, some of the things that I was talking then were probably aspirations for Unilever as well. It took us a good part of a decade to really get into a spot that I felt comfortable. Uh, and yet society is changing so fast, so you have to stay uh, stay on the move. I also remember from this meeting, my admiration for Richard went up, not to flatter him, but I said, if someone can understand that many businesses and run them like he does, man, that must, must be something to keep all these balls juggling. Uh, my business was soup and soap, so that's a little bit easier than all the businesses that Fortune is involved in. But if we could get a little bit of fun that that fortune has into the Unilever system, I could see a tremendous opportunity to unlock, you know, and this is what purpose all is all about. Colin Meyer talks about um, profitably addressing the issues of people and planet, but nothing better actually if you can save people's lives, nothing better if you give everybody the opportunity for a life that we've become accustomed to that they aspire to. So getting your brands to work on solving the issues of open vocation or uh, you know, or, or working on helping a child reach the age of five or women's self-esteem. It just makes life so much more pleasant. Uh, although you might think it's hard work and you have to go beyond what uh, an economic system perhaps allows you to do. Uh, I've discovered uh, a long time ago that for some greed may be good, but, but generosity always wins and it creates this incredible engagement and and um, employer brand, if you want to, and and culture in a company that is uh, unstoppable. The, um, the the thing that has changed, Holly, from from that period, perhaps because time goes fast, is that there is now enough data. You know, when we started, it was a little bit of an act of faith. The financial market certainly wasn't there. Many of the boards weren't there. Uh, many of the people in the companies were were taking the the easier wrong versus the harder right routes and um, and wouldn't want to entertain it either. But we've come a long way. In the financial crisis, when that happened 12 years, 13 years ago, people went back to short termism and and frankly shrinkage. And people felt at the end that banks were too big to fail, people were too small to matter, and we missed a tremendous opportunity. We didn't right size the economies. We didn't go into the direction of making it more resilient, more inclusive. And, and the results have been Brexit or elections in the US or frankly, many populist, nationalists or xenophobics in many parts of the world. Um, but COVID has been different. I think it has been an inflection point. And we've seen with COVID for the first time that companies that operated under these longer term uh, models, putting purpose at the core, sustainability at the heart of their strategies, if you want to, that these companies have actually outperformed. We see for the first time the financial market waking up, the fact that ESG funds, environmental, socials and governance are growing so fast is because they're actually starting to outperform. Now, in general, you would agree with me, it's difficult to expect the financial um, industry to move out of morality reasons. I'm still a little bit skeptical about that, but when they see an opportunity, they certainly move. In Glasgow, we had $130 trillion of money under management with the Glasgow Financial Alliance on net zero calling for decarbonizing their portfolios. The investment community is putting pressure now on companies to really move faster on, on the Paris agreements and the implementation of that. So things fundamentally have changed and I think uh, for the better. Employees expect it, otherwise they would walk out. The signals from the market are giving it right now. Uh, governments actually are moving in their own ways, but we've seen a significant commitment increase in Glasgow versus 
the year or the year before uh, on, on climate change. So companies would be well advised to move into that direction, or I would argue lead. And companies that continue to deny it are actually heading to the graveyard of dinosaurs. We, we can now see with hard financial data that companies that more aggressively attack these negative externalities are actually higher valued by the market. Uh, my, my final sentence was really was the terrible disaster unfolding in the Ukraine, which has our strongest condemnation, obviously. But the companies that made the first announcements that they would go out of Russia actually didn't see their share price much affected. Some of them actually went up. The companies that stayed in Russia and had some of or another excuse of why they should be staying and thereby financing the terrible uh, regime of, of Putin, if you want to, they actually saw their share price go down. So the financial market is even able to take a little bit a longer term perspective, especially when it gets to these issues of uh, of morality, uh, if you want to, or, um, or or the social compliance, if I may call it that way. And um, Dad, you've um, been in business for a very long time, and I, I know back in the day there were businesses um, where all of their purpose in life was just to make a profit. Um, um, have you found that times are changing and, and, and the businesses that uh, you work with and your oppositions are actually thinking more about the bigger picture as well now? Uh, I think so, uh, but not enough yet. Um, and um, I think that, uh, you know, there are, there are chairman of public companies that I know. It would be interesting to, to ask Paul whether he, he had any of the same pressure. I mean, we've got one company chairman on uh, the B team who was sacked from the company because he was trying to push the company into clean energy and, and, the, and his company was mainly in, in dirty energies. Um, uh, I don't know, did, did uh, Paul, did you ever have any pressure when you were in, at Unilever? Uh, that you were going too far or too fast from, from shareholders? Oh no, plenty of pressure, <laughs> plenty of pressure. But if I regret one thing, looking back at my tenure, uh, tenure, I didn't go far enough as uh, and fast enough. As uh, as you know, if you uh, what I call, um, which is a little bit my life slogan, it's better to make the dust than eat the dust. But if you go into these new directions, you undoubtedly have a lot of cynics and skeptics. That's why purpose is so important. I think we we have now the direction well established. What is missing, as uh, Richard is saying, is probably the speed and scale. Uh, even the financial market with the Larry Fink's and others, they're starting to move, but getting it really truly in the behavior of all of those people that manage the money is still a little bit of a job to do. And and yeah, we still don't have common accounting standards, common measurements. Uh, many areas are not compulsory to report on. We know that if companies have to report on things or make it transparent, they seem to behave better. So there is a lot more to do, and that is where the attention should go. We should not sp spend too much time anymore worrying about the skeptics or the people that are deniers of some of these things like climate change, but we should entirely focus on what are these boundaries that we need to move to collectively get the critical mass. It's really get the 60% that is still on the fence that, that Richard was just pointing out. Be sure that uh, in, in the coming years, and we only have five, six years really to do that, that they jump off on the right side of the fence. That's how I would focus on it. And, and that's very much the spirit of the B team, help people really give them confidence and give them ideas and give them tools to make that little bigger jump. And that's why we call it uh, bolder and braver as sort of the slogans that we go by. Well, I think the B team is absolutely fantastic. How, how great to be able to pull together um, businesses that are trying to do the right thing and all learn from each other. Um, uh, Dad, what inspired you to set up the B team? Uh, and Paul, what inspired you to be one of those founding members? Uh, of, of it and, it, and ha, is there any things that the B team have achieved over the last few years that you you feel really proud about? Um, so uh, I've been lucky enough to sit at the foot of the elders um, uh, listening to them uh, debate the issues of the world they they were all they are, they are all ex um, uh, leaders of their countries or ex leaders of the United Nations um, with, with tremendous knowledge um, 
uh, but they are also all elders. And um, uh, and uh, and I remember sitting in one of those meetings thinking, you know, we, we made, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a, a, a business equivalent of the elders who could uh, work with the elders in solving solving some of the problems of the world. Um, I suspect the best example that I was at was at the Paris climate talks where we had um, uh, uh, the B team were there, um, the elders were there. Um, there were a, a number of countries still um, skeptical about whether they would support the, uh, pa the, 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 the Paris climate agreement. Um, and we, we went in as a force together. Um, we went to see the Indian minister who was, uh, you know, who, who felt that clean energy was going to uh, cost more. Um, the, B the, the elders argued the moral argument. Uh, the B team argued the business argument. But think of all the all the fuel that you can that you're importing from Russia and from uh, uh, the Middle East. Um, you won't have to import it anymore if you can be self-sufficient in, in clean energy. Um, and we did the same same with China. Um, and and together, I think um, they ma they managed to uh, work work as a team. And um, and the Paris Agreement. Uh, came about, and I think they, the, but you know, the two organisations played a, an important role uh, working together. Anyway, that was my my highlight. Uh, Paul, what, what was yours? <laughs> no, definitely in uh, at the COP21 in Paris was a highlight for all of us. It was also where Ben and Jerry's was the only brand that was available. We had invented an ice cream which was called Save Our Swirled. And our advertising was, if it's melted, it's ruined. And I can tell you it was a big success. But uh, no, I, I was appeal. Obviously, when Richard calls you, you pick up the phone and you really try to understand what what uh, what he wants, and you want to be part of that. And although the elders was a little bit farther away from me than than Richard, I had been exposed to people like Mary Robinson or Mohammed Yunus or Kofi Annan or, or Desmond Tutu, who obviously I had respected tremendously. And what was very clear to us was that ultimately you cannot move society. If you don't move the private sector, it's 65% of the global economy, it's 80% of the job creation, it's now 95% of the financial flow. It is impossible if we don't embrace the private sector. And here was a group of people that instinctively felt that that needed to be done, that was willing to take a little bit more risk themselves because there is personal risk involved, as we talked before, but then um, form a collective to some extent to all be better. I've been very fortunate to be in the B team because it made myself, made me more courageous. It, it made me learn uh, from others that are there and they are all incredible leaders. And to see that it is now expanded to well over 20 people, uh, all amazing, amazing people. Lots of them authors as well, like you, uh, Holly, and uh, uh, Jean now with her book on partnership, which is tremendous. Uh, it's just a, a growing experience. You know, although we can be proud of changing the debate on climate change, where we really brought in the one and a half degree notion, the net zero, the 2030, these were all um, paradigms that needed to be changed. And we changed the narrative to some extent. But actually, if I think back on it, I, I'm more touched by some of these initiatives around again, uh, the, the human side of it. When Richard called and said, do you want to support the abolition of the of the death penalty, I'm there. When he called and said, do you want to uh, fight in some of the countries where there is still a horrible uh, punishment for LGBT, I'm there. When we wanted to be sure that with climate change, the people that suffered most uh, were, were taken care of and got the needed training and security around them, what we might call just a transition, I'm there. You know, ultimately, this world cannot function if there is not dignity and respect for everybody, if there is not equity for everybody, if we don't operate with a certain level of compassion, however you want to define that. And that really gets to the heart of the uh, B team. And if we collectively can be more courageous than even we are ourselves, then that hopefully is, is to the benefit of humanity and especially all these people that we touch. And then, you know, there are some things that business is still afraid to speak out on. You don't get business people on a panel on tax or on human rights, or on corruption or money and politics. We've worked many of these issues and it's difficult to get a panel together. Hopefully that will change. I remember 
four or five years before Paris, we couldn't get any business person on the climate change panel either. But these are still the very salient issues. And then together to speak up and uh, fight for that, fight for uh, tax transparency or fight for beneficial ownership. You know, I wish some countries would have had that earlier. The The UK has been lacking there, if I may be honest, and look how difficult it now is to put uh, sanctions in place. So some of these things that really change society, that makes makes business behave in a better uh, manner, gets to the things that get to the heart of humanity and fighting for people that have lost their voice or that we've refused to listen to uh, is probably the finest thing that the B team can do. And regretfully, it still has a lot to do. I mean, Richard would agree probably with me that our objective should be to obsolete the B team because that would mean we've arrived in a in a world that we all can live in and that we all can participate in, but but we have some way to go still. Yeah, and the world is a scary place at the moment. There's um, humanitarian crisis like you've spoken about in um, Ukraine, but that but it's all over the world. There are issues like that to, to Yemen. Um, as you say, we've got the climate crisis is going on and it's ever getting ever closer. And to hear you say we've got six years to sort that out, it's that's daunting. Um, and, and that there might be food insecurity that comes along with that. Um, I, 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 it's really interesting to hear you say how um, businesses can make a difference in that. Um, and so, so I think that is, I think there is hope. Um, do you guys feel like there is hope? Um, I, I think there is, I, I, I think there has to be hope. Um, I'm, I'm a born optimist, but we, we, we have to, um, create our own optimism. Um, uh, and as Paul says, um, uh, you know, we have to move quickly and and technology, I think, will play a big, a big role in in um, uh, in in getting on top of uh, climate change. Um, and, and we need as much investment as possible in, um, you know, companies like the Breakthrough Energy Coalition and others um, uh, that, that, that are working on trying to, you know, to get get those breakthrough technologies. Um, if we can get through the next uh, 20 years, um, uh, then uh, then uh, we'll we'll have a most wonderful world for our, our grandchildren, great and great grandchildren uh, to live in, um, because the world should be run by clean energy. Um, uh, uh, it, it should be run by cheap clean energy, um, because uh, uh, clean energy is. Uh, is is much cheaper than dirty energy is today, um, and um, uh, that food should be grown food in factories um, uh, rather than than animals having to be killed for for the food. Um, so there's 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 a wonderful glowing upside if we can just get through the next 25 years, um, and and it's up to us business leaders to you know go to governments, present on a plate. You know what they what they need to do, and then try to persuade them to. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the things the B team are trying to do at the moment is persuade them to drop all these you know trillions of subsidies on dirty fuels. I mean, it's 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 madness, and uh, at the very least, and then give tax breaks on 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 clean energy. Um, you know, that sort of that sort of decision uh, will make a bigger difference than almost any almost anything else um, in 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 moving moving the. Um, you know, moving us to a, a, a utopian world. Yeah, no, I agree with Richard. Uh, you know, anyway in life, if you have to choose between an optimist and a pessimist, you should also always choose an optimist because you have the same lives, but you undoubtedly will have a happier life. So anytime we go into the negative route, it just doesn't lead to anything. It gets you into a dead alley and, and uh, it results in unnecessary anxiety. So the hope is the right word, a story of hope we should have. I think ultimately what we're facing here is not an issue of climate change or inequality or food security, but it's an issue of uh, of greed, of apathy, of selfishness. This is a moral crisis beyond anything. We know how to build toilets, yet we have one and a half billion people still open defecating. We know how to make a piece of bar soap and yet millions die of sanitary diseases like pneumonia, diarrhea. And we know how to build houses and the number of homeless grow. So I think it is really us that need to rise individually and together to the level that, that is expected of humanity and, and frankly needed if we want to survive our own species. 
Um, hope is the best word because, uh, as Richard says, technology always goes faster than we think. We always underestimate it. 70, 80 percent of the world has now cheaper energy in, in green energy than fossil. Um, and and uh, it's becoming rapidly more attractive everywhere. We thought the electric car would be uh, passing the combustion engine in 2050. These were estimates by the International Energy Agency in 2014. We're actually passing it economically wise in 2024-25. So 20 years earlier, 25 years earlier than originally predicted. So technology goes faster. Um, why I'm actually now more optimistic is because we're at a point where the cost of not acting is actually higher than the cost of acting. This, this is why it is such an incredible business opportunity. COVID has cost us $17 trillion in Europe and the US alone to save lives and livelihoods. Kristalina from the IMS, as, uh, IMF estimates that we've lost $25 trillion this decade in GDP. It is infinitely less to avoid the issues in the first place and now dealing with the consequences. That's why the banks are moving as we talk. That's why the smart businesses are starting to move. And lastly, it's because of you, Holly. I'm not saying that because I'm talking to you, but you know, the next generation is far more purpose driven and and far more uh, 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 able and, and, and skill possessed, if you want to, to uh, challenge us and and be creative about dealing with these problems. You work better in partnership, you think multi-generational, you're more purpose driven. Um, you know, so so you have all the, the things that not only deserve you getting a seat at the table, but I think in many cases it's time for us to hand over the table. Absolutely not yet. <laughs> be, be, be careful. If she can't get get her own way with the board at at, uh, at at Virgin over some something that she feels very purpose driven and strongly about, she thinks she says to me, "Shall I ring Paul Pullman and, and maybe get him on the phone to them?" <laughs> so, <laughs> we can. We, we spared we spared you so far. We'll we'll, we'll fight our own corners, but uh, uh, no, but it's um. It's true, and, and it, it's because of heroes like you guys that make it an inspiration to us. And Paul, actually, you say something in your book which you make it easy for people because you say all a business needs to do is ask themselves, is the world a better place because your business is in it? And, and that's a really, really easy question, and it's really simple. And I think that's just something that more and more business leaders need to aspire to. Do you, um, do you, you say that's the first step. What's the next step to becoming net positive? I mean, that's a huge question and it's a whole book worth, but if you can you can try and sum it up, that would be wonderful. No, if you do it very simple, it's, um, what, you know, Rumi was a poet in the 13th century in Iran and he said it very well. He said, yesterday I was smart, I tried to change the world. Today I am wise, I'm trying to change myself. You cannot be a purposeful company if you're not purposeful yourself, just like you can't be a sustainable company if you're not sustainable yourself. So the journey starts by yourself. What is your own purpose? And then work with your uh, fellow colleagues and, and others to find this company purpose. That gives you then the courage. The first step of that courage will be to take responsibility of your total impact, to literally measure where your impact is in water, in waste, in CO2 emissions, in human rights, if you want to, in, in, in living standards. So once you have um, uh, understood where your total impact is in society, then you have to set bold targets, targets that the world needs, not targets you can get away with. In Unilever, it made us feel uncomfortable. I've always said, if targets don't make you feel uncomfortable, you're not setting stretched enough targets. So we set targets of zero waste in our factories, for example, 100% green energy. We did that already 15 years ago. We didn't have the answers, but that made us actually human. By saying we don't have the answers, we also said we can't do it alone. And it created a ecosystem around us of partnerships that actually allowed us to do more things and do more things faster. And then nothing better than making these targets public. You know, transparency is the basis of trust and trust is the basis of prosperity. So we publish those targets every year, about 50 targets, and it really served as well. And as these partnerships were growing, we actually could reach more billions, actually more people 
to uh, deeper into the bottom of the pyramid, if you want to. And it created opportunities for our company to grow. And not surprisingly, the brands that had the strongest purpose were the brands that were growing twice as fast as the rest of the company and were also more profitable. And I think you see the same thing with Fortune. You've always been driven by a higher need that you try to satisfy by always being externally focused and trying to serve that versus many companies being internally focused. So if you can create that sort of virtuous circle, uh, that level of energy, it will unlock an enormous, enormous uh, potential. In Unilever, we all of a sudden got 2 million people applying to us every year. The, the third highest after Google and Apple at that time, when, when we're not really a brand by itself, the engagement scores went into the top of the top decile. And I do believe that when we got this attack from Kraft Heinz, which is for another discussion, but where a few people tried to do man financial manipulation, it's basically uh, a model driven by value, whilst our model was driven by value through values. But we found that um, when we stood by the world in our business model, the world stood by us and the no amount of defense, including from your dad and others, that spoke up and said, you know, we really have to make a choice now as, as human beings, what type of world we want to live in, what type of business model we want to have and what we accept and don't accept. So if you invest in others, others invest in you. I've found that come back to me in many different ways. And that was the same with Unilever uh, when we needed help at our critical moments. But that's why it's important. Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits, talks about uh, depositing you know, in the bank account, call it an emotional bank account, call it a human bank account, but that's how we should think about it. And if there's enough in there, now and then you can withdraw, but you always will most likely run a positive balance and that makes companies great. And that attracts people and that makes you long-term successful. You, you put it so simply, uh, it sounds like it's an absolute no-brainer for all businesses to do this. And um, so I hope that everyone listening today and all businesses um, beyond um, buy, buy Paul's book and, and, and read it and absolutely implement these things into your own companies because the world will be a better place. So thank you so much, Paul, for all your insight today. Thank you so much, Dad, for all your insight today. And Paul, in your book, you say this is a revolutionary way of thinking in modern business. By innovation, uh, but innovation is almost always driven by rebels who force disruption. We need a profound shift for businesses to help lead the way, become the trusted player it can be and solve problems that matter. So I really just want to say thank you to you two. You are two of the most inspiring purpose rebels that I know. Um, so keep up I, what I, you're I doing. I'll give a kiss for you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Keep up what you're doing and don't pass on to the next generation that you've got another next, you've got another 20 years in you. So um please know something. You're Thanks. sitting you're sitting next to the biggest rebel. A virtual hug to both of you. Cheers, Cheers everybody at Virgin as well. Thanks, Paul. See you soon. See you soon. Thanks. Be safe. Bye bye. Thanks.